And matter of fact, as I'm trying to, to do my on-scene report, uh, one of the family members actually pulled the door open to my fire engine and started yelling in the fire engine that there was children trapped upstairs. Stay tuned coming up on this episode, a replay of episode 198, part one of a three-part show where we learned some powerful lessons from two members of the Chesterfield County Fire Department as they talk about an early morning house fire they had in 2016 that resulted in five civilian fatalities, including two children. But first, let's hear from our amazing sponsor, Midwest Fire. Midwest Fire, a factory direct manufacturer. That means no middleman. You work directly with the good folks right at their factory in Laverne, Minnesota. If you want to see just how easy it is to design your own Midwest Fire truck, check out the Create a Spec tool on their website. To get started, go to MidwestFire.com and click on the Create a Spec tab at the top of the homepage. Hello and welcome to episode 318 of the Situation Awareness Matters show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this program is to improve situation awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high stress, high consequence, time compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming in time to prevent bad outcomes. Today's feature segment is sponsored by Gasaway Virtual Training. We now have 33 programs for your members. Some are live events presented virtually and some are pre-recorded. To learn more about it, just visit samatters.com website and click on the virtual training tab at the top of the homepage. I'm also hosting a live training program presented virtually for the first time on Saturday, May 2nd titled How Smart Responders Use Situation Awareness to Improve High-Risk Decision-Making. Most first responders know intuitively that strong situational awareness is an important aspect of incident safety. However, many do not understand the process for how it is developed or how it can erode while working in high-risk, high-consequence environments. The content of this program that I'm going to do on Saturday has been presented to more than 87,000 first responders worldwide. The information shared during the session has been described by attendees as a must attend for all frontline responders, especially those on the sharp end of high risk decision making outcomes. During this powerful and fast paced 90 minute session, you will learn exactly what the term situation awareness means. Spoiler alert, it's a lot more than just paying attention or keeping your head on a swivel. You'll learn a, a solid three-step process for developing and maintaining situational awareness. You'll learn 12 challenging barriers that can destroy your situational awareness. I call them the dirty dozen. They can, they can flaw your situational awareness and you won't even know it. Immediately actionable tips ideas, best practices for improving situational awareness will be shared. This session will be recorded and everyone who registers will be provided a playback link. To learn more about how to register for this training or to purchase the playback, just click the virtual training tab at the top of the homepage. All right, I think that covers all the administrative stuff. Let's jump into today's feature segment, a replay of episode 198, part one of a three-part show where we learn powerful lessons from two members of the Chesterfield County Fire Department as they talk about an early morning house fire in 2016 that resulted in five civilian fire fatalities, including two children. Welcome everybody to this video episode of the Situational Awareness Matters radio show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway, and today I have two members of the Chesterfield County Fire and EMS 
uh, department <laughs> here to talk about a significant incident that they had in Chesterfield County. But before we get into the events of that day and the incident, I want to give my two guests an opportunity to introduce themselves. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Joy Nicely. I've been with Chesterfield Fire Department for the last 16 years. Started out my career in the city of Petersburg, spent four years there and moved here. Um, various assignments, uh, spent some time in the training division where I did incumbent training and then personnel development programs and was uh, promoted to battalion chief two years ago. At the time of this call, had only been a BC for six months. Okay. Um, I'm Captain Rick Russell. I've uh, been with Chesterfield for this will be going on my 15th year. I uh, started with, uh, as a career firefighter with uh, Roanoke County before coming here. I've um, uh, been an officer for going on eight years now, a captain for the last three. Um, my original officer uh, position was an uh, engine company at Station 3. Then I moved on to running uh, recruit schools for the organization for three years until promoted to captain. And now my current location is the uh, station captain of Engine 24, which is at the center of the county. Rick, how long were you a station captain at the station where this incident occurred before um, the incident? Right about, right about a year. Okay. All right. All right. So give us the backstory of the department. Um, the, you know, most of the listeners uh, might have heard of Chesterfield County. Those closer to you will know a lot more about it, but uh, somebody in Idaho may not. So just uh, tell us a little bit about the department's uh, general makeup Sure. We, we have 22 fire rescue stations, 18 transport units, 22 engines, five ladder trucks, and we have a minimum daily staff of 114, which can fluctuate because we have some daytime medics. Um, so during the day between 8 and 6 on weekdays, it could be 117 on, on duty at any given time. Um, we're a, a big county at 446 square miles, big for the area. Um, with over 328,000 citizens, and last year we answered almost 41,000 calls for service. And like most organizations, fire EMS organizations, 74% of those 41,000 calls were EMS. And of those 41,000, only 413 were structure fires. And of those structure fires, of those 413 structure fires, 124 were what we consider a working incident. Um, so a, significant, a working incident for us would be something significant other than a, other than a kitchen fire or rooming content where that initial first alarm assignment is engaged in activity and committed to the scene for a half an hour or longer. So anything that got out of the room of origin usually is what we would call a working incident. Now, when, when you say you had 124 working structure fires in the course of a year, um, to somebody that might sound like a lot of structure fires, but when you take that number of structure fires and you spread it over a county of your size, over that many stations, over that many shifts, each individual firefighter, unless they're from one of those stations that get, you know, the heavy load, but each individual firefighter, probably in the course of a year, will only see two to five structure fires. Am I, is my math right in that? Absolutely. Yeah, and you could have a, a slower station that's not as densely populated out in the western and, and southern parts of our county um, where they don't see that. So absolutely, which presents a significant problem for us. Um, like many organizations are seeing, um, that the lack of experience is out there, the lack of, lack of repetition, and that's why the, this call was so significant for us for many reasons, but one of the reasons it was so significant is because it was something that was so low frequency and such high risk that we were doing the operations that took place there. And we, we fell back on our training, um, like all, all good firefighters do. Uh, the train constantly, train on the basics, train on the stuff that you don't do that often so that at three o'clock in the morning, um, these guys can get it right, and they did. To also complicate the problem, we're a very young organization. We have a lot of, we've had a lot of retirements over the last five to 10 years, so we have a tremendous amount of youth, and which is great, but they lack experience. Uh, and I'm seeing that to be a problem in many, many organizations because it seemed like they, some of them, and probably yours too, did a large wave of hiring at some point, 20, 25, 30 years ago, and then that wave is now retired, and we have this new wave uh, of newer firefighters. Some, I just, uh, I can't remember where I was, but a significantly sized organization, uh, and they said that a third of their organization, <clears throat> and this was a department that had five or 600 career members, a third of their organization has less than five years of service. We're probably greater than that. Yeah. 
Really? Say, I'll give you an example. My my company that rode with, that I rode with last night, three firefighters with me, combined had six and a half years of total service. Combined. Combined between the three of them, they were all three of uh, guys that I taught in recruit school. So if they screwed up, I can't blame anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll have to own that one. You yeah, know. No, no. You, you, you said something, Joy, that I, I – before we get into the incident, I really want to really unpackage a little bit, and, and that is you, you said you spend a lot of time doing training because of the, of the low frequency of these high-risk events. So, and, Rick, you do or did um, some of the training. So kind of talk me through what you're doing to try to prepare these, this young workforce – for these um, high risk, low frequency events? What are some of the ongoing kind of training concepts that you apply to, to help prepare for these? So incumbent programs here in the training center, every trimester we go down to our training facility in Enon and do some type of hands-on training and at least twice a, year, twice a year get into our burn building and go in there and do live burns. Um, so every company in the county, all 22 fire stations, and every single employee rotates through those uh, in-services that we have down there. And then each company is expected to do some type of hands-on quality training every day. And I can tell you that they do it. It is such a young organization that they crave it um, and very, very proud of them for that. And in fact, the engine company and truck company, the engine that was the working incident and the initial truck company on the call had practice event enter, isolate, search the shift day before together. Um, to get out and put hands on it and make sure that everybody knew their role and can perform it. When you say they do, they, they do some form of training every day, are they provided with, a, with an itinerary and a lesson plan for that kind of training every day, or is that pretty much up to the officer to set up and design something every shift day? We do have uh, standard engine ops that we're required to do quarterly. Um, and the battalion chief comes out and observes the engine officer and his or her crew do those. But I'll let Rick speak to how he comes up with um, his training program for what they do daily in the station. But it's nothing set. So the, there's some stuff that comes out um, certain times of the year. Um, important things that are that are spread out that need to be trained on that are, I don't want to say mandated, but are pushed down from the training division to, to focus on some trends that they'll see. But your average shift day. It's up to the, the, I say to the officer at my station, it's, it's most of the time it's at request or, or something that one of the guys or girls want to train on. You know, what do you feel uncomfortable with? I know quarterly I sit down with my guys and go, what, what do you want to do next? What are you either interested in or scared the heck of, you know, that, that we need to put our hands on and do? Whether it be going to mess with elevators or whether it be going to pull hose up to some of the three-story guard style apartments. And they crave it. They love it. So I'm very blessed with that. So, but to answer your question, long story short, it's up to the, each individual shift on each on what they want to train on on your average day. It's a lot of district training, a lot of multi-company training. I know in the north, um, our companies will get together. Uh, ones that aren't necessarily housed together, uh, the Bon Air Station, which is kind of centrally north, and um, our our station that's over more towards the east on the north will get together, and those firefighters will work with the truck company. Um, and just get together so they know what the capabilities and expectations of each other are. It makes for a smoother operation. We have such a diverse county with different needs. Uh, Station 13, which has got farmland surrounding it, needs to train on different stuff than I do that I have shopping centers and apartment complexes covering my entire first two. And the eastern part of the county has one million square foot Amazon buildings. You know, so the training needs are, are very different on what each individual company needs to work on for their district and their surrounding districts. Yeah. You, you are a very uh, diverse and complex uh, county as far as service, the variety of services that you provide. Another question about the training is when, when these on-duty companies are doing this training, are they doing it in service or do they mark themselves out of service while they're doing the training? We're too busy to mark out of service. Yeah, they're okay. available while they're doing it. Um, and frequently they'll have to leave hose in a, in a parking lot behind a building um, and they'll just mark that on the radio and uh, Chesterfield will send a police officer to sit with our hose and they, they love doing that, but uh, they will go back and get it, but uh, they'll be in service while they do it. If there is something specific that I want to train on in our district that 
really will will hamper us being able to respond. I can coordinate that ahead of time with uh, with my BC, which is which is not Joy; it's a different one. But um, and, and we can arrange that. But that just takes a little pre planning ahead of time. I can't just call him this morning and go, "Hey, can I mark busy from twelve to 4? He's gonna go, "No, we got too many other things going on. We got dive team training and in service and and helicopter, you know, stuff going on all the time." So. They'll also set up um, with our junkyards around here uh, days to go and cut cars. And, of course, they'll mark, mark busy for that. And they'll take a, a surrounded engine company with them. They don't have to be a day where we're not doing in-service or drive, dive drill or any of that, but they arrange it ahead of time. They'll also arrange the truck companies to go down to Enon, uh, where our um, most of our training uh, facilities and equipment and everything are, and they'll go down there and do truck ops, and they'll mark um, unavailable for that. Okay, I think it was important to have that conversation because of how many times I'll have um, people, I guess, use the excuse that they can't train because they're too busy or because they can't mark out a service. And I just wanted someone out there to hear that a department with 41,000 calls a year finds a way to do their training without marking out a service. And really what you're doing is just every day, it sounds like every day, making an incremental improvement in that crew absolutely whatever that be that, that, that as as i have heard it said and i say often is it but when they leave here they're going to leave here a little smarter than when they came and that's sounds like what you've dedicated yourself to is just incrementally improving those crews every day well, training in pt it's either you'll find time to do it or you'll make excuses not to do it yeah <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Um, all right, so let's uh, let's jump into the day that this event occurred. It happened in January, so talk us through that um, day uh, in, in general. You know what the weather was like, what staffing was like, and uh, any other things going on that day that were of any concern. You know, any big events, or you know, was this your second structure fire anything you know anything just kind of lay the day out for us um it it had actually been uh really slow and that's a, a four-letter word to say in our, our department because anytime it gets said um something happens and it, it was it had been slow for a good while and uh so nothing significant was going on um being january in virginia it was cold um it was uh, 30 it was happened at three o'clock in the morning so it was 36 degrees it was raining and snowing um, and we had a significant front moving through, so we had some some good winds too, uh, 15 to 20 miles an hour, gusting at, at 20 miles an hour that morning. Um, and some units were out of place. Um, the, actually, the the fourth battalion, who should have been first due on this call, was um, actually being filled by a captain working up in that spot, and he was in the far western reaches of the county on an overturned tractor trailer with a diesel fuel leak. And so our shift commander got up in the middle of the night and went to assist that captain. And uh, I had heard that call. I sleep with my, my radio on on the tack, so I hear any significant calls and had gotten up and read the comments. And he was the only thing, that call was the only thing going on at that point in the night. Now, was that call anywhere near where this, this fire is that we're going to talk about, or was it in some other part of the county? Very, very far western reaches of the county, nowhere near where we were. It was going to put him out of place. Okay, so your res none of your first new resources were dedicated to that incident? Yeah. Uh, okay. So. Other than, other than the battalion chief. Okay. Um, the uh, I know you have a, a, a audio recording of the call. Would it be uh, appropriate maybe to start with just having that call come in, just as it would have come in for the crews, so that the, the listeners can hear how you were dispatched out on this? Sure. Okay. Um, so to go ahead and take control of the uh, of the screen, Joy, and I know you've got some resources up on on your computer there you go and uh we'll we'll just uh sit quietly and let that dispatch go through and then we'll then we'll talk about that we call away w-i-c-k-o we've got three small children and i'm a paraplegic all right listen i want to get help out there three four zero one wicklow lane yes all right what is on fire I don't know. I'm in my hospital bed. And I don't know about the food. They're okay. The children up there. Okay. House listen. Do, do you see fire? No, no. Okay. All right. Does anybody in the house see flames? I don't you know. I don't remember getting the kids yet. Okay. I need to know. Is anybody well, in the house? Flames? 
Hello? 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 Do we have flames? All right, listen, I've, I've, got, I've got help coming to you, sir. They're coming as fast as they can, okay? What's your name? My name is Richard Hudson. I'm the home owner. All right, Mr. Hudson, your phone number is 1204 South Yeah, that's my cell phone number, yeah. Okay, all right, tell me how to get to the room where you're in. I'm in the first floor of master bedroom. All right, if, if, I'm looking at, if I'm looking at your front door, are you yeah, left? Yeah, front door, you come and you make this up. You turn into a little hallway there that's on the right, so it's a little cubicle of the hallway, and I'm here. Okay, so if, if I'm looking at the front of your house, if I'm looking at your front door, are you on the room to the right of the front door? No, I'm the second room on the right. Second room on the right. All right, what is that, what is that sound I'm hearing? That's somebody yelling. Uh, all right, who's yelling? Um, lady, I don't know. Oh, I, I, understand, the I, I understand, sir. I, I know you do, sir, and I've got help coming. Smoke. I've got to go by. Sir, don't hang up. <laughs> Hello? Hello? All right, sir, they're coming. Please don't hang up on me, sir. I want to help. Are you, Look, lady, it's going to get hot. I've got to go out. I don't want to die in this fire. I, I, are you able to get out? No, I'm having somebody help me. Okay, they, 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 they're coming. So there was a couple of significant things in that call. Um, one, she did a fantastic job um, getting the information she did out of him. Can, okay, can you, I, and I was going to say give the screen back, but you did that. All right, go ahead. Um, so a couple interesting things there, and I want to give some um, credit to our emergency dispatchers at this point because she's. We have a call taker somebody who dispatches us and then somebody who'll be on the tack, three different people. And uh, she had a great deal of experience, the call taker. And she's trying to get this man to tell her where in the house he is. She got a lot of information out of him and he was doing the best he could to tell her. However, the information we got from him that was relayed to us through her was not accurate. She, she relayed exactly what he told her. However, it, it didn't end up being the case. And I'll let um, Rick explain um, a little bit more about that. It, it plays a little more into after the after we're on scene yeah uh, about making decisions of where to try to make access to known victim locations but the information of two two rooms to the right of the front door once you see pictures of the front of the house that doesn't that doesn't add up when you're on scene trying to process where this where this victim is yeah before before we get there um, talk to me about what would be dispatched to this call as far as resources Want to play the dispatch? Yeah, I have the dispatch if you want. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead and play it. Engine 24, engine 2, engine 20, truck 9, TSO, ambulance 31, battalion 3, battalion 1, Wicklow Lane for structure fire. Engine 24, engine 2, engine 20, truck 9, TSO, ambulance 31, battalion 3, battalion 1, 3401, Wicklow Lane, cross street of Kings Crown Road and Lake George Hamlet subdivision, 31, spoke at a residence on TAC 3 through 314. So for a residential structure fire, we get a three one and one, so three engines, a truck, a medic, two battalion chiefs, and a TSO for us as a tactical safety officer. So that's the uh, standard response. Um, medic two was also put on this call. Um, there was a report of somebody trapped inside on the uh, initial dispatch. Once we marked them route, they gave us that update. And she added medic two as well, which is a fire department medic unit. Ambulance 31 is volunteer. So they can't perform any fire functions once they get on scene. They're strict, strictly rescue. Okay. And what are you, what are you, which battalion are you, uh, Joy? I am battalion three. Battalion one was put on this call and he's coming from the central part of the county, uh, which is a good distance away. Um, and battalion four, who should be on the call, heard it, put himself on the call. And then as the comments started coming in, he realized the significance of it. And he announced how far away he was, which was a good distance away. And Battalion 1 put himself back on the call because he knew okay. I was myself for a while and that the call was significant. And what are you on, Rick, in this call? I'm the captain of Engine 24, first engine. Right. First engine 24. Okay. Um, all right, if you want to go um, 
uh, off the uh, screen share and then we'll continue the conversation. Um, <laughs> expert at this, Joy. Uh, okay, so we got uh, three engines, a truck, uh, two EMS units because of the report of, of possibly somebody trapped, battalion three and one, the tactical safety officer, battalion four um, on the call. So uh, how long for the, f who's first in? Engine 24. All right. Company. Yes, sir. All right, and how many's on your engine? Uh, it's a four-man engine and company on nights and weekends. So this, this night, unless we get pulled down, if somebody around the organization goes home sick at another station, our minimum staffing is three, but we have um, four engine companies that are at four-man staffing um, yeah. when things are perfect. That's All not right. always the case, but this night it was a four-man engine company. All right, and that's just so I can round out my understanding of the staffing. How many's coming on engine two? The rest of them all have three firefighters on it, including the officer. So three man staffing on everything else coming. The, the truck as well. The truck as well. Did it? Okay. And the, uh, the second due engine had three. The third due engine had three, and the truck company had three. Okay. And then uh, the battalions. Do you have drivers, or are you alone in the battalion? Uh, we're by ourselves in the vehicle. Okay. Um, and the tactical safety officer is one person unit as well. Right. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. That helps me out. All right. So uh, on the way to the call, Rick and Joy, talk me through what you're hearing on the radio and what you're thinking and what your concerns are. Okay. Uh, we, uh, Orange Company, had run another call about midnight, one o'clock in the morning for an EMS response. Um, one of my ALS firefighters had to drop and go to the hospital with the volunteer rescue squad and had got back not too long before this was dispatched. So I guess we'd all been back at best sleep maybe about an hour, and it got dispatched as as smoke, uh, smell of smoke in a in a residence. Um, so as you're waking up from that that slumber, I, you hear that you know you start trying to process what it possibly could be. That time of the year, I'll be honest, what was in my head was you know smoke smell from an HVAC unit or you know just so many things that we run like that. Um, but with no more information than that, that's where we're going to the unit thinking, not sure exactly what we're going to. Didn't have any information at this point of somebody trapped in the house or flame scene. Um, as we marked in route and start looking at the comments on our MDC computer, um, it's obvious that, that this is working. And at this point, I know that one person is trapped in the house and it's a, a handicapped person that cannot get out of it on their own. Um, it's a very short distance from my station. Um, do you know the exact mileage? I think it was uh, two miles. So, so two miles. You know, it's a it's a short it's a short trip, um, very short amount of time period. To uh, I didn't get all the information off the MDC because you have to switch back and forth between the screen that shows call data and the screen where you can do your mapping that shows where your hydrant locations and the lengths of your legs. So I did not receive all of the information that was continuing to come in because the computer dings. But you have to be able to know where you're going and where your hydrants are to be able to start relaying that information of where you're laying in from. So it very quickly, we knew it was a lot more than just the smell of an HVAC unit, you know, something going wrong with that. I, I think it, 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 it's fair to pause here and just say that you're processing all this information of a working fire with, with people trapped and just to acknowledge that your entire crew has collectively about six years of experience. Not that night. My crew oh. currently now does. This has been two years ago. Okay. So uh, my, my driver... Uh, was just released as a, we call it an MPO, a motor pump operator. He was released that day. He had a year on the street. He was released that day as the driver of that engine. Uh, one of my jump seat firefighters had about six or seven years, and my second jump seat firefighter had 20, Don Nobles, what, 25 years. Mm -hmm. So a very experienced firefighter in that. So I was lucky with, uh, with that I did have some experience and tenure with me on that fire engine that night. So <laughs> that's not the case. Yeah. I, Joy, how far, how long is your response to this and what are you thinking on the way? Um, I'm probably about uh, six to seven miles from there. And uh, knowing I had been up earlier, knowing that my command staff's coming from a distance and I, I obviously don't have a driver, so I can't read comments going down the road and our dispatchers will update us of anything pertinent because they know that. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, what resources do I have coming? There's at least one person trapped. I've read what I can before I leave my office, and then when I pull out of the bay onto the ramp, I stop one more time while I'm switching my tack channels and cutting my lights on, scan it, and all I had seen at that point was one uh, 
a bedridden person trapped in the house. And uh, so I had requested an additional engine and medic to care for that patient because you're going to at least need that many people for somebody who's been um, trapped in a house fire. So that would have been a fourth engine or, or the third? Correct. That would have been a, the fourth engine. And what engine was that? Engine what? Uh, that ended up being engine nine. nine. Engine nine. Which okay. Company that and was the second medic then medic two? Um, was there... Medic two was already on the call, so she informed me that she had already put them on the call. Oh, okay. All right. And uh, so about two minutes later, Rick, um, you're pulling up. So describe for me, while the wheels are turning, uh, what you're seeing and what you're thinking. Okay, in route, um, told the guys over the headset reading the comments that, that it's obviously working. We got reports of somebody trapped. Um, gave a little bit of reassurance to the, to the I called a kid. He's not a kid, but he's early 20s, uh, driving. You know, take your time, focus on your job, because he was, he was nervous, as you can imagine, but did fantastic. Uh, located our, our hydrant, relayed to the second and engine company where we're going to be laying from. And as we're getting close to the scene, our PD marks on scene and with heavy, you know, heavy fire involvement in the house. So we, we know that it's really working at this point. As we're staging, uh, while one firefighter is wrapping the hydrant, um, you can see a heavy, heavy column of smoke in the distance. So it's obvious that this is, this is really working. Um, as I look down the road, you can see people in the road out in front of the house. And as we're laying in, there's actually a, a lady walking down the street in a bathrobe that I'm having to blow the air horn at to get her out of the way. <clears throat> as we pull up in front of the house, there is as much fire as I've ever seen on a residential house fire. Uh, it was so much fire that I couldn't even tell that there was a second floor to the house. It was f flames literally probably 60, 75 feet in the air. And you couldn't tell how much, what, how many floors were to the house. My actual on-scene report that there was a, uh, uh, called it a one-story single family wood frame. Um, it ended up being two-story. We relayed that after the on-scene. But um, as we're pulling up on scene, there's, there's literally police officers and, and family members and neighbors running all different directions around the yard. And the entire, you know, three quarter, half to three quarters of the house fully involved in fire through the roof, um, partials of the roof involved, um, a car in front of the garage heavily involved in fire. And matter of fact, as I'm trying to, to do my on-scene report, uh, one of the family members actually pulled the door open to my fire engine and started yelling in the fire engine that there was children trapped upstairs. Thank you to Battalion Chief Joy Nicely and Captain Rick, Rick Grazel for sharing your powerful story with us. Remember, this is part one of a three-part story, so be sure to check back the next two weeks for parts two and three. Since 2007, SA Matters instructors have helped more than 1,200 organizations and 87,000 individuals improve high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, aviation workers, oil refinery operators, and more. If you or someone you care about works in a high-risk, high-consequence, decision-making environment, then we are here to help improve their safety and survival. I want to help you accomplish the most important mission of all, and that is to go home to the ones who love you. Normally, this would be the part of the show where I would thank the organizations that have hosted Situation Awareness programs, and I would share a list of the upcoming events, but the pandemic and social distancing rules have caused all of the events to be postponed. So I'd like to take a walk down memory lane and thank the organizations that were hosting programs this time last year. The Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, the Fire Department Instructors Conference, the Washington Fire Training and Safety Officers Association Conference, the Waconia Fire Department, the International Association of Fire Chiefs Company Officer Leadership Series, the Cook County Emergency Management Associ uh, Agency Conference, and the Maryland Fire Chiefs Association. All of our programs, past, present, postponed, and future, are listed on the SA Matters website. If you're interested in seeing the list of where we've been or where we're going, just head over to the site and scroll about halfway down the home page and click on the red box that's labeled Upcoming Events Schedule. If you're interested in hosting a program virtually 
or live when the pandemic's over, click the contact us tab at the top of the homepage and I'll give you a call. Remember to check the show notes for how to subscribe to our newsletter and how to follow us on social media. There we share ideas about how to improve situation awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 318 of the Situation Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you again to Battalion Chief Joy Nicely and Captain Rick Grazel from the Chesterfield County Fire Department for sharing your powerful story with us today. And remember, this was part one of a three-part story, so be sure to join us next week for part two. Thank you to our amazing platinum sponsor for more than five years now, Midwest Fire. Thank you to our feature segment sponsor, Gasaway Virtual Training. And thank you to our associate sponsor, Chief Miller. And most importantly, thank you, the listeners and viewers of this show, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters Show with Dr. Richard Gassaway. If you're interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit his website, essaymatters.com. If you're interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for a program, or if you would like to be a guest on his show, click the Contact Us tab at the top of the homepage.